So, what exactly are coral? If you were here last class, we would know that coral are actually animals. A lot of people mistake them for plants, but they are actually animals. And if you were listening to the video, these animals are related to jellyfish and sea anemone. So corals are related to jellyfish and sea anemone. Now, I want to ask a question. Let me just stop screen, share, screen sharing for a second. So when you see that big coral structure, do you think that that's one big animal? When you see that big old rock coral structure, Aaron Demerit says no. Renique Lewis says yes. No. Kendrick P.S. says no. Shimiko Duncan says yes. Ah, so D. Hepburn says no, it's many little ones. So the coral reef or the coral structures you see are not just one big old animal. They are actually potentially thousands or millions of these little animals called coral polyps that make up the whole coral structure. So let's do a little reading. So coral may seem like a large rocks, like large rock structures, but each is actually made up of hundreds to millions of tiny animals called polyps. Corals are of the phylum Nidarians and are distant cousins to sea anemone and jellyfish. These fragile creatures build themselves a protective home by secreting a calcium carbonate skeleton from the calcium collected from the water. The colony a colony is when many polyps from their homes to get, form their homes together, together. These colonies are what we call coral. So in the passage it says that all of these little tiny coral polyps are, are called a colony. So the big rock structures that we see inside the water, those are actually millions of coral or thousands of coral polyps. Um, stuck together with their calcium carbonate skeletons and they create this colony. So if you look at this picture and you look at the close-up, you see that those are tiny little coral polyps and they're stuck together and they form together with their calcium carbonate skeletons, but they are actually individual, individual, um, animals. So within these animals, right, they also have kind of a partner, I would say, a, a plant partner. So they, the coral itself are not plants, they are animals, but they have these tiny little algae called zooxanthellae that lives within it. So these zooxanthellae are very helpful to the corals because one, they perform photosynthesis. And we know that photosynthesis is the creation of food by plants using sunlight. So when these algae create these foods, when the algae pho photosynthesize and create food, the coral polyp actually um, benefit from this because they can actually consume the food that the zooxanthellae create. About 95% of the food that corals consume comes from the zooxanthellae. So in return for their food, the coral would provide the zooxanthellae with um, things like carbon dioxide and other nutrients that the, the algae may need to grow and photosynthesize. So these, so these, um, these zooxanthellae, they live within the coral tissues and they actually give the coral their color. So that pretty vibrant color that you see the corals have, they are because of the zooxanthellae. Now, if these zooxanthellae were not inside of the coral, they would not have a color. They would actually be white.
so the structure of the coral. Everybody can see that the, the um, big old structures that they see inside the water. The structure of the coral polyp, sorry. Now these little um, polyps, we see they have tentacles, they have a mouth, they have a stomach, and they have mesenterial filaments and the zooxanthellae within their tissues. Now let's start with the calcium carbonate skeleton. Let's stop screen share for a second. What does the calcium carbonate skeleton do? It protects them. So Aaron Demerit says they protect them. And Samuel Sherman says it keeps the coral anchored. So yes, um, the calcium carbonate skeleton protects the coral. It protects the soft body of the coral because the coral, the, the actual animal is soft. So it protects the soft body of the coral and it also helps them to anchor them onto rocks in the surface of the seafloor. Should we be writing a summary of this? No, I will, I will um, send it to be posted on the virtual learning website. So, let's start screen sharing again. Sorry. So the calcium carbon skeleton is used for protection and to anchor them onto the seafloor. Now the tentacles, let me stop screen sharing one more time, sorry. What do tentacles do? What do they, what are they used for? Don't Google Lancel. Okay, yes. So the tentacles are used to catch their food. So we know 95% of the food that the corals eat comes from the zooxanthellae, where the other 5% comes from their surroundings. So they catch their food using their tentacles, right? These tentacles have a stinging cell on them. I see Samuel Sherman says they are used to bring food with the mouth using stinging cells. So what are stinging cells? What are the stinging cells called? What are they called? Pneumatocysts. So the sting so the stinging cells are called pneumatocysts. And these stinging cells are used to catch the prey. The prey that um um corals go for are called zooplankton. Now, remember that the corals are actually um, thousands or millions of tiny little coral polyps. So they can be you no know, big old fish and stuff, like jellyfish or a sea anemone would eat. So they would actually go for microscopic zooplankton, which are tiny little animals that swim around inside of the water. So what do they eat? They eat zooplankton. I'm gonna start screen sharing again. And then we have the mouth, and we know that the mouth is where the tentacles bring in the food that they catch. Sorry. Okay. So now we have the stomach. When we eat, when us humans eat, we put our food in our mouth and then, then it enters the stomach. So the stomach is where the food is digested. So when we already catch, when the coral polyps already catch it there, um, 
when the coral polyps already catch their zooplankton and they put it inside their mouth, it goes into the stomach. But it can't use the zooplankton just like that. Like we can't use our food just like that. It has to be digested. So the stomach has digestive enzymes that will break down the zooplankton into smaller, to smaller um, substances that the coral can use for growth and energy. And then we have mesenterial filaments. I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to ask you guys, what do mesenterial filaments do? What do mesenterial filaments do? So Myla Crawford says they ward away other corals. So yes, um, the mesenterial filaments ward away other cor corals. Can you imagine you, you're sitting down, right? And then someone you don't know comes and tries to sit on you you would swat them away, right? You'd run them. So that's exactly what the mesenterial filaments are for. They, um, they ward off other encroaching coral that may try to um, embed themselves on top of them. And then now we have, lastly, the zooxanthellae, and we know what these are. They are the symbiotic algae, which live within the tissues of the coral. They provide about 95% of the food for the coral, and they give the coral their vibrant colors. Now, another question that I want to ask. What is a symbiotic relationship? And as the year is a Nazi is asking, so they kill them, they kill what? Kill the coral that's trying to embed them, bed on them. I wouldn't say they kill them, they just like shoo them away. So, so Samuel Sherman says it is a relationship where both participants benefit. Um, Thalia Smith says it is a relationship where both species benefit from each other. So yes, these are correct. So a symbiotic relationship is a relationship between two organisms in which both of them benefit from each other. So Zuzantli gives coral 95% of its food and in return, the coral gives the Zuzantli a place to stay or protection. They also allow them to, they um, allow them to get sunlight and they also give them some nutrients that they need. So now we are going to move on to the types of coral. And there are two types of coral. These are the hard corals and the soft corals. All right. So first we're going to start off with the hard corals. So the hard corals are the reef builders. So hard corals are what the predominant types of corals that are that make up the coral reefs. So these are the corals that secrete the hard calcium carbonate skeleton. And some species we have are the elkhorn coral, the brain coral, the pillar coral, and the staghorn coral. Hard corals are the reef builders. So here we have our brain coral. That's a common one that you may identify. Then staghorn coral and elkhorn coral. So as you can see, the difference between the staghorn coral, the staghorn is like a little bit pointier than the elkhorn. And you can see the elkhorn coral, they resemble the antlers of elks. And then we have our pillar coral, which also is another type 
of hard coral. All right. So these are our reef building corals. These what make these are what makes up the coral reefs. Now we're going to look at our soft corals. So the soft corals are the corals that do not secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton. These are the flexible plants looking types of, of, of corals, but these are actually animals. So don't get them mixed up with plants. So they look, they resemble like trees just swaying inside of the currents of the water. And some of these include sea fans, sea plumes, sea fingers, and sea whips. So sea fans, I think everybody is familiar, well, majority of everybody is familiar with sea fans. So this first picture right here is a sea fan, a big, beautiful orange sea fan. And then we have a sea plume. The sea plume looks like feathers to me, so like some of those, you know, Mardi Gras or Junkanoo feathers that they use for parades. That's a sea plume. And then we have sea fingers. They look like, this looks like a monster hand or something. They kind of resemble the pillar coral, but they are not the pillar coral. Pillar corals are hard corals, but these are, are soft corals. And then we have a sea whip, which is just a collection of long, flexible coral whips, I would say. All right. Now, who can name me two hard corals and two soft corals? Do all of them be in water? Yes, they both are in water. Pillar coral, Anna Rika Bulek says pillar coral. Myla Crawford, Crawford, morning. Maya Crawford says pillar coral and brilliant coral. So those are our um, hard coral. We also have the elk horn. coral, which is also a hard coral. Now I'm seeing a sea fan. Are sea fans hard or soft? Soft, yes. Sea whip. I see a sea whip. So sea whip is hard or soft? Yes, sea whips are soft corals. So now, since we are since we know the difference between our hard corals and soft corals, well, what is the difference? I should ask you guys that. What is the difference between hard and soft corals? Good morning. What is the topic for the day? Because I just came. So today we are on coral reefs. Uh, Maria Thompson says the texture is different. Rakesha Nemo says on one's harder than the next one. Myla Crawford says soft corals have no calcium carbonate. So yes, soft corals do not secrete calcium carbonate skeletons. Hard corals secrete calcium, har um, calcium carbonate skeletons, sorry. The difference is that hard corals are made out of calcium carbonate and soft corals are flexible. So yes, all of those answers are correct. So now, dangers to the coral reef. In the ecosystem, there are some dangers that are threatening the coral reef ecosystem. Now these can include pollution, climate change, tourism, poor fishing practices, and dredging. So let's look at how, firstly, pollution um, endangers the coral reef. So when sediments and other pollutants enter the water, they smother the coral reef, speed 
the growth of, growth of damaging algae and lower water quality. Pollution can also make corals more susceptible to disease, impede coral growth and reproduction, and cause changes in food structures on the reef. Animals may also be entangled by pollution, such as nets and plastic soda packages that can strangle them. So, in our last video, or sorry, in our last webinar, we talked about corals needing shallow and clear warm waters. So, if we have pollutants that are preventing the sunlight from coming in to the water and getting to the xanthalene, within the corals tissues. Those zooxanthellae are unable to photosynthesize because this, this pollution is blocking the light. So when this happens, the zooxanthellae actually leave the coral and this is when we get our coral bleaching. And we know that the zooxanthellae gives the coral 95% of its food. If you lost 95% of your food, that means you would die. So that's what happens when pollution prevents sunlight from getting in or getting to the zooxanthellae. The zooxanthellae will leave the, the coral and look for somewhere that, look for another coral that can provide what it needs. In turn, the coral becomes bleached because the zooxanthellae gives that coral the color and the coral die because they have lost 95% of their foods. So here we have some pictures of pollution. We see a plastic bag. We see some barrels, looks like some oil barrels in there. And yeah, pollution. Now we have climate change. So, so now, um, climate change we know is the warming of the earth or the warming of the climate, the gradual change of the, warm, of the climate. So, and this causes the polar ice caps or the glaciers in the North and South Poles to melt. And when these melt, they cause the sea level to rise. Remember the corals need shallow, warm, and clear waters. So when the sea level becomes too high or the corals are too deep, they're unable to get a certain amount of sunlight and thus contributes to coral bleaching and infectious diseases. Yeah, I don't know if you can see this, but in the first picture, on the left, this is actually a healthy coral reef. Now in the middle right here, we see that it's all white. That means that something happened, the zooxanthellae left, and now the coral have been bleached and now do not have that 95% of food supply. Now this last picture here shows that they are dead. So, this coral reef may seem a lot, may seem similar to the first one right here on the left. The one on the right is dead, but it has been taken over by algae or not zooxanthellae, but a different type of algae or a damaging type of algae. So, so the zooxanthellae instead, so the coral instead of the zooxanthellae being inside the tissues, these are algae that just settle on top of the corals, the dead corals. Now, tourism. Now, tourism, coral reefs are a tourist attraction. So tourists come here to look or to examine our coral reefs. But this can be damaging to the coral reefs because they can actually dive and explore the reefs and unintentionally break the corals with like, you know, this, their little flippers. And then we also have the large cruise ships that sail through the coral reef. And when they um, release their anchors, they may drag these anchors across the ocean floor and start breaking up the coral reefs, damaging them and 
destroying the ecosystem. So here we have an anchor being dragged across the ocean floor. And then we also have some poor fishing practices. So fishermen, they are looking to make some money off of the fish that they um, catch. So they may use some of some practices that are extremely harmful to the coral reefs. Some of them they use bleach or harmful prep, harmful chemi chemicals, sorry, to draw fish and crawfish out of their crevices so that they can catch them. Some of them use explosives. Now, when you use an explosive, they can actually stun a school of fish to make it easier to make it easier to catch them. Now, when they use these explosives, you run the risk of destroying or blowing up the coral reef on the ocean floor. And then also the use of large nets that drag along the coral reef floor and they damage the corals as well. So I don't know if you are able to see it, but you can see the explosion right here. that explosion that damages the coral reef floor. Now also we have dredging and urban development. So when we, when hotels and homes are built um, too close to shore, they actually, actually can um, create sedimentation, which also makes the water cloudy or not clear. So thus, sunlight is unable to get the zooxanthellae, and then bleaching occurs. So that is a coral. It's, it's very hard to see, but that is a coral covered in sedimentation. Any questions? So has there ever been an explosion in the Bahamas? Not a big one. So explosion, they, but I would reckon some fishermen have used explosives to um, catch this fish. What happens if all the coral die? Well, that would be bad because first of all, the marine nurseries, that means we all, all those are gone. Um, fishing, there'd be less fish because that's where they, they have their eggs, they lay their eggs. How do corals reproduce? So corals, they reproduce asexually and sexually. So sexually, they release their gametes, their eggs and their sperm. They fertilize, they, the eggs become fertilized inside of the water, and then they find a suitable spot to start growing. So the fishes will die, yes, the fishes will die if all the coral reefs are destroyed. So now, I have a little activity for you guys, and I will give you guys 10 minutes to complete these questions. Oh, sorry. Before the questions, let's just go on to Coral Reef. I did mention it already. So coral bleaching is when corals become stressed by external factors that the zooxanthellae are released from the coral as the zooxanthellae leave the corals turn white. This can be caused by the rising water levels, like I mentioned before, the temperature stress. So remember the range that corals need to grow. And 
and sedimentation. Susan's leaf provides the coral with most of their food. They leave, then the coral will eventually starve and die. So when the water becomes unclear, when the temperature becomes too great or too little, and when the waters rise, that's when you see the zooxanthellae leave the coral. The coral loses its color and its main source of food and eventually will die. So now, the, this is a picture of bleached coral. So this is when the zooxanth this is what happens when the zooxanthellae leaves. These are staghorn corals. And then I will go over these questions with you guys. Okay, everybody, time for the answers. We have two reasons why coral reefs are important. So coral reefs are important because they provide an income from, for the Bahamas because they attract tourists, and they also are a nursery for juvenile marine organisms. Those are two reasons why. You can also have, they are habitat for organisms, and you can also say that they produce um, medicines that can be used to treat certain illnesses such as cancer. Number two, name the four different types of coral reef, reefs. So those are the atoll coral reefs, which are the ring-shaped coral reefs, the barrier reef, the fringing reefs, and the patch reefs. Reefs, sorry. What is the name of the largest reef in the world and where is it located? So the largest reef in the world is the Great Barrier Reef and it is located in Australia, off the coast of Australia. Describe an atoll coral reef. So those are the coral reefs, the ring-shaped coral reefs that surround a lagoon. What temperature range do corals need in order to grow? So 74 degrees Celsius to 84 degrees Celsius. I mean, sorry, Fahrenheit. So that is the temperature range. Name five organisms that can, poten that can potentially be found within a coral reef. So I wanna see you guys in a different number six. Five organisms that can be found in the coral reef. 73 degrees Celsius, I mean Fahrenheit, to set 84 degrees Fahrenheit, sorry. So I see some polyps, so we have, of course, coral polyps, scorpion fish, I don't know what that is, but it's probably there, black tip reef sharks, Sean Moss says black tip reef sharks, so yes, that's four we have, Zuzantali. Yes, yeah, Suzanne Flea is in there. Anybody else? What about Nassau groupers? Moray eel, yes, they can be inside the coral reef groupers, yes. So these are the organisms. I see sponges, clownfish. Yes, they all can be found in the coral reef. Snappers. Anybody else? Jellyfish, sea stars. Why does the Bahamas have one of the largest percentage of coral, but has one of the hottest climates? So the Bahamas has an, the ideal conditions for corals to survive. I see crabs, shrimps, anemones, plankton, I am new. Do we have to write this in our books or at home or in the chat? You can write them in the chat. Sponges, sea stars, and seahorses. So yes, all of these are organisms that can be found in the coral reef. And I see lobsters as well. That's a good answer. So are there any questions before I leave?
before I adjourn class. class. Crawfish, yes. They can be found on the coral reef. Any questions? Can you repeat the four types of corals? You mean the four types of coral reefs. So the atoll coral reef, the barrier reef, the patch reef, and the fringing reef. Can you see my message? Um, rays, yes, stingrays can be found inside the coral. There are any more questions. So. Everybody, please be safe. Remember to wash your hands and use hand sanitizer. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Miss Simmons. I'm from Doris Johnson Senior High School and have a nice day. How big can one coral reef be? Last question, how big can one coral reef be? Could be really big. The, great, the biggest one is the Great Barrier Reef. All right. Hello, students. Welcome back to science. I am Mr. Corey Gold. We are going to explore all about pulleys, wheel, and axle. At the end of this lesson, we should 1. Define key vocabulary terms 2. Examine types of simple machines and 3. Investigate how simple machines make work easier. Let's get started. Do you remember these simple machines from grades 4 and 5? A. Lever. Very good. B. Incline plane. Excellent. C. A wedge. Very good. And D. A screw. Good job, student. Let us look at the definition of key terms. Work is done on an object when a force moves the object through a distance. A pulley is a machine that is made up of a rope or chain and a wheel around which the rope fits. A pulley that stays in one place is called a fixed pulley. A pulley that moves up and down is called a movable pulley. A wheel and axle is made up of a large wheel attached to a smaller wheel or rod. Name two parts of a pulley. Two parts of a pulley are a rope, chain, and a wheel. You are correct. What is made up of a larger wheel attached to a smaller wheel? It is wheel and axle. You are correct. How do you know when work is being done on an object? The force moves the object through a distance. You are correct. Define the term movable pulley. A movable pulley moves up and down. You are correct. Which type of pulley stays in one place? A fixed pulley stays in one place. You are correct. Here are the different types of simple machines. A pulley. As you can see in the picture, when you pull down on one rope end, the wheel turns, and the other rope end moves up. Fix pulley. It is used to raise and lower something lightweight, such as a flag or a small sail. Movable pulley. 
one end of the rope is tied down. The load is hooked to the pulley. Pulling upon the rope makes both the pulley and the load rise. Wheel and Axle A doorknob is part of a wheel and axle. The large round knob turns a smaller axle. Here are two other examples where you can find a wheel and axle on a bicycle and on a wheelbarrow. How does simple machines make work easier? Let's find out. Is it a fixed pulley or a movable pulley? Explain how it is used. It is a movable pulley. It is used to lift objects that are very heavy and it makes work much easier. You are correct. Very good. Examine the picture below. Is it a fixed pulley or a movable pulley? Explain how it is used. It is a fixed pulley. It is used to open and close the blinds. Very good. What about number three? Is it a fixed pulley or a movable pulley? Explain how it is used. It is a movable pulley. It is used to lower the bucket. Very good. Beep, pop. Beep, beep. Green pop. Green pop. Identify the following simple machines below. A pulley. You are correct. Wheel and axle, you are correct. Differentiate between a fixed pulley and a movable pulley. A fixed pulley stays in one place and a movable pulley is free to move up and down. You are correct. Very good. Science experiment for the week. How to make a fixed pulley using a hanger. Students, please read the instructions carefully. Once you want to follow the instructions, you should be able to create your science experiment. Have fun and good luck. It's time for recap. Work is done on an object when a force moves the object through a distance. People have some machines to make work easier. A fixed pulley makes work easier. It is made up of a rope or chain and a wheel around which the rope fits. A movable pulley is free to move up and down. One end of the rope is tied down. The load is hooked to the pulley. The wheel and axle is a machine consisting of a wheel attached to a smaller axle so that these two parts rotate together in which a force is transferred from one to the other. Kudos to you students, you have done a fantastic job during this science lesson. I can't wait to see you next time for another amazing science lesson. Enjoy.